Good evening to you and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Tammy Arinder. Thank you for joining us. And joining us tonight, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And a little later, tonight's special guest, Dr. Carrie Simonson, Chair of Pediatrics at UNMC and Pediatrician-in-Chief at the Children's Hospital and Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. Dr. Gold, appreciate you being with us on this Monday evening. I know our viewers are looking forward to your updates and the opportunity to ask their questions and of course you at home are a very big part of this show and a little bit later we are going to open up our phone line so we can take your questions but first Dr. Gold you're always a wealth of information with the latest numbers and data so let's get right to that. Well thank you Tammy and it's great to be with you this evening. Uh, we have much to talk about tonight with the uh, winter weather, the upcoming holidays, Delta still challenging us widely across the country and of course uh, parts of the rest of the world literally on fire with the Omicron variant. So let's get right to the graphics, which I think tell the story of where we are in rural America today. If we start off on the global scene, uh, what we can see is we're just under 275 million confirmed cases worldwide, uh, about uh, 650,000 in the last 24 hours, and that's up about 4% over the last 14 days. About 5.3, 5.4 million confirmed deaths due to COVID and over 6,800 deaths in the last 24 hours uh, worldwide. When we look at the map, uh, you can see uh, that there's a lot of COVID going on, particularly uh, in uh, Western and Eastern Europe, the Scandinavian countries, the Southern Horn of Africa, but of course the Far East, the Middle East, and the North American continent. We're now starting to see more coloration of yellows, ambers, and slight areas of red in South America, and the Caribbean islands as well. In previous weeks, I've shown you some of the early maps of the world regarding uh, the Omicron variant, but unfortunately tonight it would be almost identical to the map that we're looking at here. When we start to look at the United States, uh, you can see uh, that we continue to have continued growth over 21 percent increase of cases uh, in the last 14 days, over 133,000 cases in the last 24 hours. Hospitalizations are again up significantly, uh, just under 70,000 Americans are hospitalized. And tragically, we've started to see yet another uptick in the death rate. So as we look into this a little, a little bit more detail, uh, the map of our nation, uh, you can see we are no longer seeing the really intense hot spots uh, across much of the southeast and the Pacific Northwest and even the Mountain West, with most of the concentration being in New England, the Mid-Atlantic, the Great Lake areas, uh, etc., extending down to the southwest. But if you look very carefully, you can see in the southern tip of Florida, certain parts of Alaska, etc., we are seeing bright red coloration indicating a very significant case growth uh, across our nation. If we look at it by state, uh, there is no question uh, that Rhode Island, uh, one of the smallest states in our country, of course, has now per 100,000 got the highest case growth of 101. That's about two and a half times uh, the U.S. average. Uh, New Hampshire is at 90. New York is at 83. Much of that is Omicron. And we'll look at that in just a few minutes. Ohio and Massachusetts also have extremely high case growth uh, at this time. If we look at the rate of cases per day in the seven-day rolling average, you can see that the last several weeks, uh, including the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, has shown just a continual uptick uh, in the number of cases. We're not quite up to the cases uh, per day. Uh, that we've had at the peak of the Delta variant and certainly not up to the peak that we saw a year ago at this time. But unfortunately, the trend does appear to be in the wrong direction. If we look at the hospitalizations uh, across the country, uh, you can see that Michigan and Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Delaware, extremely high, and that does tend to mirror what we've seen in the cases. And so as we have always seen, the case rates rise, and then within 10 to 14 days, hospitalization rates rise, and then within 10 to 14 days, tragically, mortality rates start to rise in our states uh, as well. 
So this is a look at where we are in terms of variant distribution, and I would draw your attention to the very, very bottom of the last column, indicated in purple. Most of the country, uh, well over 95 percent, is still being confronted by Delta variant, <clears throat> but now we are starting to see just a bit of Omicron pop up in certain parts of the United States. Now, understand that if we go to other parts of the world, they are predominantly Omicron variant. Now, this is the map of the United States that I showed last week when we were together. You can see geographically it's almost 100 percent Delta variant. And if we shift to the, to the map most recently of the United States, you can see slivers of bright colored starting to appear in other parts of the country, particularly in the mid-Atlantic, uh, where uh, they're dealing with about 15 or 16 percent of the Omicron variant. But even in other parts of the country, such as in the uh, Texas area, the Northeast, uh, even parts of the Great Lakes area, even in my home state of Nebraska, we are starting to see increasing and significant numbers of the Omicron uh, variant. When we look at this, just to remind our audience, uh, while the severity is really not clear just yet, some of the early reports are that the Omicron infections seen here in light blue uh, are less severe and a lower risk of hospitalization, so it's not clear what the severity of the illness is. But what is clear is that the Omicron variant spreads at least twice as fast, if not three or more times faster than Delta. And Delta spreads a good five to six times faster than the original version of coronavirus that we saw back in the winter of 2020. So this variant uh, is particularly geared for rapid spread and hopefully not much more in the worst of severity. Uh, this is a chart that I thought would be interesting to our audience tonight, Tammy. This looks uh, not at the U.S., but it looks at South Africa. Uh, and it looks at the rate of spread uh, and the, the role towards becoming 100 percent of the diagnosed cases for the beta variant, the delta variant, and now in bright red, the Omicron variant. And what you can see in terms of time, it took the beta variant uh, more than uh, 100 days uh, to get to about 50 percent of the diagnosis. It took the Delta variant about 100 days uh, to get to about 80 to 90 percent of the diagnosis. It took the Omicron variant 10 days uh, to get to 90 percent of the diagnoses in South Africa. Just to give the audience an idea of how fast this is spreading, you know, there are reported cases of individuals who are becoming symptomatic after a confirmed high-risk exposure in under 24 hours. Totally unheard of for the beta variant and the delta variant. Uh, this is a graphic that looks at, uh, you know, breakthrough from reinfection. And again, uh, what we see here pretty clearly uh, is that uh, the breakthrough infections from individuals that were previously infected from either the original Wuhan strain, the beta strain, uh, or the delta strain, were extremely low. Uh, it's not that they were unheard of, but they were at a pretty flat rate. Uh, that is not true with Omicron. We are seeing a very significant rate. Indeed, some of the preliminary data from Europe uh, and from uh, South Africa are showing that as many as 80 percent of the individuals uh, were previously infected and a significant percent between 70 and 80 percent have been previously vaccinated. So again, characteristics of the Omicron variant that favor the reinfection and favor breakthrough. This is a look at hospitalizations per day in the United States. And as we said earlier, uh, we're not quite back to the levels we saw with Delta in August and September, but that curve continues to rise and considerably lags by about two weeks. Uh, after what we saw with uh, the Delta variant. Deaths uh, by state, <clears throat> tragically, Michigan is back to the top of the list. Arizona, Alaska, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Again, death rates are lagging indicators uh, per 100,000 per day. Uh, but unfortunately, we are going to be seeing these numbers uh, continue to rise. Uh, finally here, uh, let's look at COVID hospitalizations across the United States. 
Uh, and as we can see, this map mirrors the map of rapid case growth. So what we're seeing in the Great Lakes area, what we're seeing uh, in the southwest, and what we're starting to see in the mid-Atlantic are rapidly rising case rates. Uh, there was just a recent report that in, in New York State, for instance, they went from a single-digit number to over 20,000 cases per day of Omicron, an all-time high uh, record uh, diagnosis of COVID. This is a look at our death rate chart uh, for the U.S. And uh, why don't we stop at this point, Tammy, and uh, this would be a good time uh, to start to answer some of our audience questions. And I'm sure we have a lot to unpack as we get into the holiday season, questions about vaccinations, boosters, and we need to be sure to use the expertise of Dr. Simonson specifically around her knowledge and experience in the pediatric practices. I think you're so right. There is so much ground to cover, and you would think that week after week it might be waning, but not so. So many people are asking questions, and what's next? More shutdowns, more cancellations, and of course, what to do with those kids. So we're going to give out the phone number here in just a second. We are going to take a short break, but our phone lines are going to be open. If you do have a question tonight, then that number is 877-731-6733. And when we come back, Dr. Kerry Simonson, Chair of Pediatrics at UNMC will be joining our conversation, and we hope you will too. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. You can give us a call if you have any questions or want to join our conversation. That number once again, 877-731-6733. Joining myself and Dr. Gold is Dr. Kerry Simonson, the Chair of Pediatrics at UNMC. Thank you so much for joining us. We sure do appreciate your time on this Christmas week. Now, Dr. Simonson, we understand that you are now a part of clinical trials in testing a vaccine in children as young as the age of six months. Tell us more about that. Thank you, Tammy. Yes, here at UNMC, we've been taking part in the Pfizer clinical trial for kids between the ages of six months and 11 years old. And as you've seen, um, the trial has progressed for those kids who are school age between five and 11, such that they're now included in the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine. And we continue to um, investigate the uh, vaccine with those kids between six months old and four years, hopeful that they too in time will be included in uh, the vaccine eligible population. All right, very good. We're going to ask some more questions about that and go deeper into that. But we already have our first caller this evening. Don from Ohio, what's your question? Yes, my wife and I are in our late 70s. We have had our uh, Moderna double shots in January, February, received a Pfizer booster in late October, and wondering what is the expected time, you know, how long is this booster going to last, Is it, and will this be effective against the new uh, uh, Omicron? Well, Don, you know, everybody's asking that same question, and unfortunately, we don't have a truly scientifically based answer. I'll share with you uh, the best of knowledge uh, that I believe we have, and that is those individuals that are boosted are pretty well protected against severe illness uh, from Omicron. Now, of course, we've not seen a major outbreak of Omicron yet, other than in the mid-Atlantic uh, in our nation. And so a lot of this is based on experience that we're seeing in Western Europe and experience that comes from laboratory tests of these vaccine products. So there will be some breakthrough infection. There's no question. Dr. Fauci has been extremely articulate about that. And unfortunately, for some of our older population and perhaps those that are immunocompromised, the very old and the very young, uh, we may see some hospitalization and serious illness uh, as well. But right now, uh, short of wearing your mask and worrying about, you know, large groups and uh, travel and things of that nature, uh, being fully vaxxed and then boosted with either of the mRNA products, the Moderna or the Pfizer product, is the very best that we can do. All right, Don, thank you for that question. And staying in Ohio, Debbie, welcome into the show. What would you like to ask? Hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, my first question is, I would like to know who names these viruses and why? And my second question is, I have a niece that's very concerned about getting vaccinated. 
uh, because she's going to be married next year, and she has heard that it can cause you not to be able to conceive. And I would like to know if that's true. And I would also like to know if you get one of the viruses and you have that natural immunity, does that give you protection against one of the other kind of viruses? And thank you so much for answering these questions. Well, Debbie, uh, thank you for being part of the show. And I'll take one or two of them, but uh, then we'll switch to our real expert on the infertility question. Uh, but uh, in terms of who names them, the use of Greek letters as opposed to uh, the specific genetic title uh, as was conceived by the World Health Organization. And what we're dealing with is the Greek alphabet. So alpha, beta, gamma, delta, uh, et cetera. It sounds almost like a uh, sorority or a fraternity, but those are the uh, sequence that they've been named in. And so we're up to Omicron. Uh, and uh, fortunately, there are quite a few letters of the Greek alphabet left. Unfortunately, we may need more of them before this uh, pandemic uh, is over. Uh, in terms of your, uh, your question uh, about infertility, I think there's pretty good data on that uh, that should be reassuring uh, to your niece. But uh, let's uh, see what Dr. Simonson thinks on that one. Thanks, Dr. Gold. Yes, initially there was some concern about whether or not fertility would be impacted by coronavirus vaccines. They are a new product and we didn't have much experience with them. And so uh, the experience now that we have with millions of pregnancies and uh, millions of doses delivered and, and thousands of pregnant moms is that there really is not an impact uh, on fertility risk that has been identified. And there is definitely an impact with um, mothers who are expecting being um, more severely ill or potentially a high risk population if they get COVID infection. So there's now a strong recommendation from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology that women who are pregnant or who desire to become pregnant should get vaccinated to help protect them during their pregnancy as well as protect their babies. Yeah, as if I recall the data, Dr. Simonson, there was a 20-fold increase in fetal loss associated with COVID during pregnancy, even in low-risk pregnancy. Uh, and so that's, you know, again, underscoring your recommendation that women uh, who are pregnant or are trying to get pregnant should get vaccinated. All right, Debbie, thank you so much for that call. Uh, Dr. Simonson, I'd be curious to know, too, when the kids come in, are, have you seen many sick kids when they do come in? And are the parents more hesitant to get their kids uh, the COVID vaccines now that they're eligible? You know, I think we're seeing um, a whole gamut of responses, just as we have when the adult patients were uh, able to be vaccinated. We have some families who've been eagerly awaiting the date when uh, that vaccine would become available for their child. And we have other families who have specific questions and concerns, maybe have an underlying health condition they want to talk to their doctor about. You know, I think it's very important that we draw those families in. We address those concerns individually and we help, you know, reassure them and allay any fears they might have uh, as they prepare their children for vaccination. And then as we've seen in adults, there are also some parents and, and uh, who bring their children in who have heard some uh, misinformation about vaccines or about COVID and they they have uh, some serious questions and some reticence. And so we're also dealing with some of that, uh, trying to help um, provide them with factual information and a better understanding of uh, things from the medical perspective. All right, and I think that's one of the reasons we continue to do this show is to be able to correct that misinformation and make sure people have the information um, and educate them on what is best for them and their family. We have another call, or let's go to New York and David. David, welcome into the show. What's your question? Uh, I wonder epidemiologically uh, what Dr. Gold and Dr. Simonson would think about the um, uncontrolled uh, immigration at the southern border, I noticed Arizona had a high death rate, and uh, how we could best control that uh, where many are not even being COVID tested. 
Yeah, well, David, uh, while I really have no expertise about controlling immigration and the challenges that are faced about that, but anything that we can do to keep from spreading the virus in our country uh, is certainly going to be in our best interest. As uh, our audience probably knows, uh, as the Omicron variant was just about named and discovered uh, the week before Thanksgiving, uh, most of the large countries in the world, certainly Western Europe, uh, parts of uh, our, you know, Canada, the United States, etc., and many other parts of the Far East, uh, put travel restrictions in place uh, because they wanted to keep the spread of these viruses down. Unfortunately, what we're seeing now widely across the United States is community spread. That is to say, we can't identify where the high-risk exposure actually occurred. Initially, it was somebody gets off an airplane, they then go have dinner with somebody else, and then both of them end up getting diagnosed with COVID. Uh, that is no longer the case. We have just a lot of spread that's going on uh, that's untraceable uh, in the United States. And so whether it's at the border, whether it's at our airports, or wherever it may be, uh, we need to do everything we can uh, to reduce the spread. And the tools we have are, you know, very straightforward. We have the vaccines and their boosters. We have masks and we have the usual uh, social precautions that unfortunately uh, we've all learned to live with over now nearly two years. Hard to believe, almost two years. Our next caller comes from Florida. Helen, what's your question? Hi, thank you for taking my call. My husband is 74 years old. In excellent health, he is a paraplegic for most of his life. The end of October, he had his second J&J. &J. We know he needs either a Moderna or a Pfizer. What would you suggest he get and when? Well, the uh, current recommendations uh, are two months, I believe, uh, after the J&Js, uh, although uh, in your husband's particular case with two doses of J&J, &J, uh, I would recommend speaking uh, to his health care professionals before making that decision. However, if there is yet a booster in his future, uh, the strong recommendation at this point would be for one of the mRNA vaccines, either the Pfizer or the Moderna. Dr. Simonson, do you have any more information that we might share with Helen on that? You know, I think that specific timeline, uh, I agree, is a little bit individualized based on his previous vaccination timeline. But I do think there's good information now that after having a J&J &J vaccine, to get one of the mRNA vaccines, either Moderna or Pfizer, is definitely in, in the patient's best interest. And so we are recommending that. But between those two choices, Moderna or Pfizer, I would say it's either one, whichever is more convenient and available for you. Now, we know it's too early to make any definitive scientific statement, Dr. Simonson, but what are we seeing from those clinical trials you were telling us about just a few minutes ago as we follow these kids kind of down the line, so to speak? You bet. You know, it's been um, a little bit of a disappointment. Just this past week, Pfizer made the public announcement that for the kids under five, they were actually receiving a smaller dose than the kids five to 11, and uh, their immunity did not appear to develop as robustly after two doses. So those kids will remain under study, and it's likely that they will have a three-dose series before we're ready to um, approve a dose for kids under five. So it does look like that timeline will be extended just a bit from what we saw for the school-age kids and the adolescents. And so right now we're in a wait and see period um, awaiting further guidance from Pfizer. Um, and that's what they've told us as a study team as well as what they've made publicly available so far. All right. Well, now, when we do think about vaccines, or when do you think they will actually go beyond what's considered emergency use and become fully approved for different age levels? That's a good question, too. And, you know, I think that will continue to flow um, over the months as we've had 
um, more time elapse from that emergency use authorization and then more people being vaccinated in the community. So the um, CDC will and FDA will re-review the safety data and then also um, the dosing administration data. Uh, and that's how we'll go back through that process to get formal approval. And as you know, we've done that for the older adolescents and adults at this point um, and we'll anticipate that for uh, those 12 to 15 year olds as kind of the next step and the school age kids I would anticipate it would be well into 2020 before we would get that final approval or 2022 excuse me yeah so it's my understanding uh, that the uh, Pfizer product is fully FDA approved for 16 year olds mm -hmm. and older currently and I believe correct me if I'm wrong Dr. Simonson I think that is currently the only product that has that uh, qualification. Yes, that's correct for the 16 to 18 year olds um, and the Moderna right now is 18 and above for the formal approval. Good information. If we're going to go to Missouri now for our next caller and Arthur, Arthur, what would you like to ask our experts? Well, thank you so much for taking our call. We really need something like this going on, and we appreciate it. We and that was all my question is this. Unfortunately, I was in Missouri, and we seem to be up and down. One minute we're at the bottom of the list, and the next minute we're at the top. And I just turned 83 years old, and I've been diagnosed with COPD and stage, and I've had both my vaccines. And now there's some confusion about whether I should get the booster or not. Some say yes, and some say no. Can you uh, help me in my confusion stay here? Sure, Arthur. Thanks for calling in and joining the show tonight. Uh, the current recommendations are individuals that have had a full sequence of either the Moderna two-shot sequence, the Pfizer two-shot sequence, or the J&J &J single shot uh, should have a booster. And as we said just a few minutes ago, uh, the choice really is yours as to what's most convenient. However, most are recommending one of the mRNA vaccines. However, every individual is different. They're different by their age. They're different by their community as to what's available. And they're also different by individuals that have different medical problems, what medications you take, whether or not you've had been treated for cancer or other things, etc. So what we always recommend, what I always recommend, is uh, talk to your local health care professional, the individual that writes your prescriptions, the individuals that you go to for your routine health care. If uh, that's not available, your local public health department is more than able to help you uh, answer your questions as to what your individual uh, best solution would be. But right now, you know, as I've said to this audience uh, previously, I have not only been uh, fully vaccinated, but I've been boosted uh, with Pfizer product because that's what we had in our community. And uh, that doesn't stop me from wearing my mask every place that I go and being really careful about travel and other such things, uh, groups and, and gatherings and, and whatever. Uh, but uh, that is the recommendation. That is what the science shows. It's been shown in our country. It's been shown in other parts of the world. Uh, the, even with Omicron, the boosters seem to be the most effective means of preventing infection and certainly preventing severe illness and hospitalization. All right, Arthur, thanks for that call. Uh, we've got um, Tom now from Iowa. Tom, what would you like to ask the doctors? Yes, hello. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, my wife and I are in our 60s. I have some underlying health conditions. You just mentioned uh, gatherings and groups, and especially with the holidays coming up here. What is best practice for that? What should we be doing? What should we not be doing? Uh, we have like two holiday gatherings, one with a smaller group, like six people, and then some with a larger group that's closer to probably 20. And I, I know a couple of the little children may not have been vaccinated, probably have not been vaccinated because of their age. So I'm just wondering what best practices you can kind of give uh, viewers uh, for attending holiday gatherings where you're going to be eating and, and exchanging gifts and all that sort of stuff. 
Well, Tom, uh, again, as we get into the holidays, these are very, very good questions. And I'm going to ask Dr. Simonson in a second as to what she's recommending. But I'll tell you what I've been recommended. And that is, first, to the extent possible, to be sure that those, at least the adults that are going to be present, are fully vaxxed. And if they're eligible, they've had their booster. Secondly, uh, to keep the group size to as minimum as possible. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, being uh, in the neighboring state to uh, Iowa, uh, we're probably not talking about outdoor gatherings in the end of December, I'm just guessing. Uh, but uh, to the extent you can be outdoors with good air ventilation, uh, if you're indoors, uh, always a good thing to do. And then finally, the recommendation that I think makes the most sense is to get tested before you do it. Uh, that not only protects you, but it protects others. And right now, we've got quite a good availability of these over-the-counter test kits that you can buy in your local pharmacy or food store. Uh, the administration, the White House, has said that there'll be reimbursement uh, for that expense uh, over a period of time, which is good news. And so the advice I've been given is before heading out on the morning or, you know, going to the airport or the train station or getting in the car, uh, do one of these uh, rapid tests, get a 15-minute answer, convince yourself that you're negative, put on your mask, be sure you're vaxxed, and then go enjoy the holiday uh, with your loved ones. Dr. Simonson, what are you advising your patients? I mean, you, you live this every day. Yeah, I think that's great advice, Dr. Gold. Thank you. Um, we are recommending uh, really a cocooning strategy, trying to keep those young children who cannot yet be vaccinated surrounded by people who are fully vaccinated. So for older kids and for adults, um, if they're not fully vaccinated yet, now is absolutely the time to help protect those more vulnerable, um, including those young kids um, who are not yet eligible for the vaccine. And then I think um, as as far as continuing to do things like wearing masks, if you're in a, a larger group, a group with multiple families, um, or a group where you're headed out into a public space, um, then I would absolutely make sure that everyone continues to mask, even if you know your own vaccination status. That's just going to help keep everyone in our community safe. It is. I like the idea of getting that test before you go to that gathering. I've not used one of those over-the-counter tests just yet, but I think I will I will do that because you're right. You walk into that gathering with confidence, and you can share that information with your family so that everyone knows it. Um, let's go to Pam now in Michigan. Pam, what's your question? Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I received the booster shot in early November. Uh, six days later, um, I started having symptoms of a cold, a stuffy head, slight cough, no fever. Um, I did test positive for COVID. With the short time frame of getting COVID after having my booster, is that going to be any good? And if not, would I need to eventually get another one and when? Well, Pam, uh, certainly sorry to hear that you had COVID. I hope you've had a complete recovery and are not one of those individuals that has gone into the what we call the long COVID uh, syndrome. Uh, you certainly sound great uh, on the phone tonight. Uh, I think that you should be probably as well off as you can possibly be. The combination of the booster and the infection should raise both your vaccine-created immunity and also what we call your innate immunity both the, the, what we call the humoral and the cellular components, the part that's in your blood and the part that your white blood cells manufacture and re typically remember. Uh, in terms of another booster, you know, I'm going to guess probably not, but uh, let's ask Dr. Simonson, who's really the expert on this. Thanks, Dr. Gold. Yes, at this point, there's not a recommendation for additional boosters. Um, it is another area that will probably continue to evolve in the future. But at this point, um, the caller would be uh, fully vaccinated and fully boosted and then potentially have some additional immunity that came from also acquiring the infection. So I think that um, you're as protected as anyone can be at this moment, and that's a good thing. You know, there will be some new boosters that will be available that are being tested uh, in other parts of the world right now that are somewhat different than the ones we've used in the United States. And they may have a little bit more specificity uh, for the use against Omicron. 
Uh, I don't know what the timeline is going to be till they might be clinically available, but uh, that's something uh, that we might want to track also, particularly if Omicron starts to spread across the United States the way it spread in all through Europe uh, and the southern horn of Africa. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Now, we're going to take a short break. Our phone lines are open. We love it when you join into this show and be a part of the conversation. The number 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Tammy Orinder. We've been talking with Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Dr. Kerry Simonson on the latest COVID information. You can give us a call if you have any questions or want to join our conversation. That number, 877-731-6733. Now, Dr. Simonson, when we talk about the pandemic, there are many ways that it has affected all of us. I mean, ourselves, our loved ones. We've all known someone who's become sick, possibly even died. But in terms of stress, or even stress from how the economy is reacting to this. How do you think the pandemic has affected kids in ways that we might not even realize or think about? You know, the pandemic really has impacted kids very significantly, even when they haven't been the highest group that's ended up in the hospital with infection. You know, they've been impacted by loved ones um, being severely ill and dying from COVID. The CDC has estimated that over 100,000 children have lost a caregiver, um, and that is a huge impact that will be lifelong for these kids whose families have changed. Um, another impact that we've really been seeing is on their school performance. Uh, kids definitely lost some ground with their learning throughout the course of the last year when many, many schools went to remote learning. And kids have also been impacted by a loss of uh, some of those activities and, and things that they enjoyed doing. And that has really impacted their uh, social development. We've seen significant upticks in kids who have um, expressions of depression or anxiety as a result of the, the lifestyle that we've all been experiencing throughout the past two years. Yeah, that is a, a huge emotional impact on a lot of children and families in general. Uh, we have our next caller now. We're going to Texas and Gary. Gary, what would you like to ask our experts? Well, first of all, I'd like, really like to thank you for the show. And I've got a specific question about <clears throat> the uh, fatality, fatality rate on children under 10. But first of all, I just wanted to I come across a lot of people in my life. And going back to the Spanish flu, you know, if you study it, you know, it wasn't the first wave that got us, it was the second wave that ravaged our country. And I'm finding what I call COVID fatigue everywhere. People not knowing, you know, people, I've got the J, all my family's vaccinated, but two of them got COVID. And when that happens, I don't know, if something happens, clicks in, you're like, it didn't work, you know, this isn't working or something, you know. And so now I talk to people about vaccination and masking and things like that and they just don't have the same sensitivity to it that they did under delta and i'm so worried about omicron because i think we're suffering from that fatigue um that i see uh, these are well-educated people some of them even doctors and they're going I, it's we don't know we don't know we don't know and when we look at our authority figures in society and they don't, and they say, we don't know, <laughs> it's not very comforting. On the other thing, I want to pick up on that last caller real quick. I have a son that's dyslexic, 15 years old. He didn't learn anything last year, remote learning, uh, not at all. Uh, so I wish the leadership in this country would step up and take the stigma off these children and take the burden on us as a society that we failed them they're not failing. No one's told them that. It's no, it should not be a stigma that you've taken a, a grade over, that you didn't learn anything in that grade. And from the president on down, we should be talking about that. These kids are our future. They're the ones we're really worried about on vaccinations or not vaccinating or are we changing their DNA? Are we doing this? Are we doing that? <clears throat> it's our children that we're worried about. They're our future. But we're not speaking to them, and we're really not speaking to the matters that impact them as much as we should. We're, just, we're staying a little too high level for them. 
Well, right. Gary, thank you for calling. Uh, your points are well taken. Uh, let me just state really clearly that uh, we have a moral, ethical obligation to protect those in our communities, those that we love in our immediate family, those that are most vulnerable, those that our kids go to school with, those that we go to church with, etc. And we know what tools will work. They're not perfect. There's never been a perfect vaccine. We've certainly seen the ramifications of multiple different variants of COVID. We've not dealt with a pandemic of this proportion, as you have said very clearly, uh, since the 1918 influenza pandemic. And uh, hopefully we will not get to the mortality rates and the complications of that and the economic impact of that across our nation and across our world. But we do know what tools we have, what arrows we have in the quiver. We know which work and we know how to use them. And there is no stigma associated with using them and there shouldn't be. And frankly, as you said, uh, there's no stigma in recognizing the fact that there are a significant number of young women and young men, whether they're in our K-12 schools, whether they're in our universities, or even adult learners, who have lost a significant amount of learning opportunity over the last year and a half, almost two years. And we're going to have to do something about that. We are, certainly in our communities, we've recognized that. We've seen changes in performance exams and things of that nature. And we're putting programs in place to attempt to help. We know, not just from a purely academic perspective, but from a socialization perspective, from a maturation perspective, we are going to have a lot of catch-up work that's going to need to be done. Maybe, Dr. Simonson, you know, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this because I'm sure you've dealt with families uh, who either have been challenged with COVID or the child themselves was challenged with COVID uh, that had to do some catch-up work academically. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Yes, this is a major issue impacting children and families this year. Um, all of our kids had gaps in their schooling during uh, the previous academic year, and uh, the educational publications that we're seeing are really showing that those gaps resulted in learning loss. So kids are behind in our country and kids are behind globally. And we need to recognize that those yardsticks of the past are not the best uh, predictor of where kids are today. We need to meet them where they are and help them continue to develop those competencies that they need uh, to be successful in school. And so I think that's really where our educators and our educational programs need to focus in meeting kids where they are right now and helping them to be successful. You know, we're still um, continuing to work with schools and trying to keep kids safe and continuing to do um, those simple things like masking uh, in classrooms and, and encouraging them to be in person. And so those are the kinds of challenges we continue to navigate is uh, avoiding that um, jump to go back to remote learning, but finding safe ways to keep kids in the classroom. You know, Dr. Simonson, in terms of actually getting sick, we've heard many times that kids will be fine, that COVID really doesn't affect them. Is that true? And will vaccinating kids make a difference in trying to beat back the pandemic? Thank you. You know, kids happily, in comparison to adults and particularly older adults, have not uh, been as severely impacted with COVID, but they are definitely impacted. And we've seen thousands of children in this country end up in the hospital, um, over 8,000 children to date. And so that is a significant number of them. And for hospitalizations, as we look at um, the proportion of people in the hospital, how many are kids, it's it's usually between one and four percent of hospital patients uh, that are in the hospital with COVID. So the numbers are smaller than adults, but they're real and they definitely impact our kids. And so we want to keep them healthy um, and learning and out in the community and not in the hospital. And so vaccines have really helped us to be able to protect them. We want to welcome in Evan now from Alaska. Evan, what's your question? Um I was reading in Kucharski's book about the r not value of contagions and, and uh, things going viral. And my question is, when you look at the, um, the pandemic through the r not lens, 
what aspect do masks play in um, making one of those values less? And that's the reason reason why masks are, are really good at helping uh, prevent spread. Evan, that's a really good scientific question. So for our audience's benefit, the r naught value is what is referred to as the reproduction rate for the virus. That, what that means in simple terms is if one person gets the virus, uh, how many others are they likely to shed it to? So, for instance, <clears throat> influenza is between uh, 1.3, 1 1.5, maybe as high as almost 2. That means for every person that gets infected, they're likely to spread it to approximately 1.5 other people, somewhere between 1 and 2 uh, others. When the Wuhan strain of the virus was first identified, the r naught value uh, was just over the flu, uh, so just under 2. When we got to Delta, we were looking at r naughts that were calculated roughly between 6 and 7. Uh, nobody really knows what the r naught is right now uh, for uh, Omicron, but it is estimated to be somewhere between 14 and 18. Uh, that means that without mitigation, meaning vaccines, social distancing, masks, sanitizers, uh, etc., uh, that we're talking about one person transmitting the virus uh, to as many as 15 or more other people. It was just a study that came out of South Africa that indicated that the Omicron variant reproduces in the human uh, airways more than 70 times faster than Delta, 70 uh, times faster. And so for all of those reasons, good quality facial protection, facial protection that covers your nose and mouth, markedly reduces your ability uh, to spread the virus uh, to others and also reduces your chance of getting infected, particularly with droplet-borne material uh, from people who may cough, sneeze, people that are eating or drinking or even speaking, singing, etc., uh, in the reasonable proximity. Uh, we know that these are airborne, aerosolized spread, uh, but we also know that facial protection is highly effective, uh, and uh, that means well-fit, good quality facial protection. A lot of people are talking about double masking, etc. Let's ask Dr. Simonson, what are we advising to our kids and our school-age uh, uh, folks? Well, again, I think this is a really interesting question and a, and a terrific thought experiment, but I'm not sure I have a precise answer for pre uh, exactly what the reduction is uh, with masking. There are many variables, as you can imagine, uh, the proximity to the patient uh, who is potentially spreading the virus and the conditions, air conditions within the room and how far away you are. So uh, things other than your mask have an impact on the likelihood of secondary infection. Uh, what we are recommending for families with kids, I think the primary thing that we're recommending is making sure they find a mask that fits well and that their child will keep on uh, covering their nose and mouth. So a mask that falls off uh, becomes a, a chin cover when someone is talking. You know, you've seen this happen with children especially who are a little bit smaller, uh, making sure that it fits properly, stays on their face, and is comfortable enough to wear in a public setting. I think that's the most important feature uh, for families when thinking about a mask for their child. I'm seeing some superhero, well-fitting mask as stocking stuffers. This, this Christmas, I think that would be a great gift for the kids and they'd be excited to wear it. Uh, let's go next to North Carolina and Bill. Bill, welcome in. What's your question? Good evening and welcome uh, to Piners, North Carolina. We watch you weekly and we wish you were uh, reproduced uh, throughout the week. But the question is, Dr. Gold, thanks for your tough schedule and being on every Monday night. We appreciate it sincerely. Um, we have got the booster, and I don't know what our immunization is, but we know young people have got the COVID naturally, and they have a high immunization. Is there an uh, exponential down curve with our booster shot on that? And thank you, and Merry Christmas. Well, thank you for your kind words, Bill, and uh, appreciate uh, your joining the conversation tonight. 
Uh, I think that we don't know what the rate of loss of immune capability is adequately from the boosters just yet because we started boosting uh, just not too long ago. What we have seen uh, across the world uh, and other parts of the world started boosting somewhat before we did, such as Israel, for instance. Uh, they predominantly uh, have been using Pfizer vaccine, and so it's very similar to what we've been doing in the United States. And they've seen a significant result of reduction of Delta virus hospitalization and Delta virus death. They have seen some breakthrough uh, of uh, infection, but a relatively low rate over the first couple months. Now, as far as the ability to prevent some of the earlier strains of the virus from causing infection or severe illness, it looks like the boosters are holding both on a humoral and on a cellular immunity level. However, Omicron is a different animal. Uh, it is a, a radically different genetic composition, over 50 mutations uh, in the virus itself, about 30 of them in the spike protein. So I would say that we're going to see more breakthrough, even in individuals that have been fully uh, vaccinated and have a booster. You might have just seen a recent announcement that two uh, well-known United States senators uh, have been uh, diagnosed uh, with Omicron variant of COVID, uh, and they were fully vaxxed and boosted. So uh, we need more information, uh, particularly regarding the timing of yet another potential booster dose at some point in the future. But right now, it does appear uh, that if you're boosted, uh, particularly in the time frame that you described, uh, you're likely uh, to be okay. Dr. Simonson, any other thoughts uh, as far as uh, uh, timing of booster durability or anything that's been recently published that I may not have come across? Thank you, Dr. Gold. No, I would agree with your um, explanation uh, thus far. Um, and I would just uh, reiterate, I think, for our audience that um, if you had two doses of a vaccine early on and haven't yet gone out to seek a booster, now is really the time in thinking about holiday gatherings and the emergence of the Omicron variant. Getting boosted, if you haven't already, it really is urgent and, and set up that appointment now to get that booster shot. Very good. I know we've had some callers that have been on hold. Unfortunately, we're into our last minute or so of the show, so we apologize for not being able to get to you because, um, Dr. Gold, I do want to give you a chance to also give your final thoughts as we head into this Christmas week. Well, certainly, Tammy, I want to wish you and our entire audience a very happy, safe, and healthy holiday. But as you just heard from Dr. Simonson, it is critically important for individuals that are not vaccinated to get vaccinated in all age groups above five. And it is critically important for those individuals who are not boosted to get boosted immediately. Absolutely. Dr. Simonson, we've got about 45 seconds. Anything you would like to add? No, thank you again to everyone for calling in and, and to Dr. Gold and, and Tammy for hosting this evening. It's a pleasure to join you. Absolutely. It has been a pleasure having both of you. And of course, we've had so many callers tonight with some great questions. And I think a big takeaway, Dr. Gold, when you say as these gatherings are coming with, with children and family, to get that test before you go to that gathering and get that mask. Is that your best advice? <laughs> and get your shot. Get your shot if you haven't already. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. Dr. Carrie Simonson, we appreciate your time and information today. And, of course, Dr. Gold, all the work you put into making this show so helpful. Have a great evening.